Okay, I'm just going to moderate. Keep time and uh, make sure we have some time at the end for a question and answer. So I'll uh, make sure that uh, we get to that. And my panel is the one after this and there is no break. So I'm going to make sure that, <laughs> that we keep to time. Um, so our first speaker. Uh, are you, you going to stand up? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. But it's a great uh, pleasure to be here, and uh, also an honor, given that this is a Hyman P. Minsky conference. Um, someone, obviously, who has inspired some of my work in the past, and also inspired um, some of the things, my, my analysis of the Cyprus crisis, which is the book that I wrote, the diary of the, uh, the, diary of the Euro crisis in Cyprus, of about the event there. Now, uh, what I'm going to do now is per perhaps going to be a little bit surprising. I don't know how to change the slides first. I need to sort of... Okay. Oh, great. Okay. Um, partly because when people talk about reform of the euro going forward, they sort of um, talk about the incomplete architecture, right? And on the financial side, the incomplete architecture, there's an obvious pillar missing in the banking union, and that's EDIS, that's European Deposit Insurance Scheme. And that is true, and that's sort of caught up in all the political uh, discussions and controversy between Germany and France about risk um, reduction and, uh, and risk sharing. Um, a lot of that has to do, well, Germany says NPLs are too high, we can't do that yet, etc., while France is pushing for, for more risk uh, sharing. And interestingly, I mean, the Eurobarometer shows actually that the Euro's approval has diminished more than anywhere else in France and Germany in the last year. That's the 2018 Eurobarometer. So that's quite an interesting background to that. I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> um, there is also a lot of discussion about um, what do you do with f on the fiscal side, right, for risk sharing. Um, the IMF has proposed a rainy day fund. It seems like a reasonable way to go. The Commission has made other proposals about creating some sort of uh, fund at the federal European level, including a finance ministry at, at the European level. That was Juncker's proposals, but uh, nothing really has, has happened. And then we have the Franco-German economist proposals, which is a, a very nice uh, sort of um, attempt to break the deadlock by making some uh, comprehensive sort of uh, suggestions to address everything. But I'm not sure where, where that's going anyway, but it's good that we have that. Now, what I want to do is different. Why? Because partly because I've been involved in, you know, I've experienced the crisis firsthand. And sort of those insights that I got from that suggests to me that the current architecture actually is not working, right? There are things in the architecture that have been eroded. In fact, it's not even the architecture, it's, it's the engineering side of things. That has been, the architecture is there, but the enforcement of it isn't happening. And I think that touches on, on the point that Dimitri mentioned about, about sort of the effectiveness of the commission to uphold the treaties. And that, that's partly, partly it's been the problem under two commissions and two commission presidents, Barroso and Juncker, both EPP sort of uh, key people, the European Pe People's Party, right? And I think there's a lot of uh, uh, politicking, uh, game playing there in the commission that, if anything, has meant that we, we've gone backwards in terms of uh, making sure that the architecture, the plumbing, right, is, is actually working. But I'm going to focus on, our, on the central bank's independence and related, related sort of uh, aspects. Um, okay, so the first thing to note, well, there were a lot of people who were sort of predicting the demise of the euro at the peak of the crisis, and they were proven wrong, and including some Nobel Prize winners on this side of the Atlantic, and they were saying that, oh, Greece should leave the euro temporarily, permanently, whatnot, etc. It's not working. It, it hasn't happened. 
So the, the euro is still here, it's intact, right? And it, if anything, in fact, the approval ratings have, have been going up. In fact, in the crisis countries, if you look at Ireland, Ireland has the highest, the euro has the highest appro approval rating in, in Ireland, which is a plus. Um, but not so in Cyprus. Cyprus has one of the lowest euro approval ratings, right? Um, and uh, I think Lithuania so is, is the lowest. Um, what is striking now, I mean, when I left the Central Bank of Cyprus, and I did leave it by um, sort of stepping down early for my term, just because I couldn't, I, I, I had enough of, of the political pressure, basically. And I described what happened in the book. And it, is, it wasn't just the political pressure, it was the legal changes that they made, right? And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But the importance of boards, right? The importance of boards. It's not just the governments, it's not just what you have for the governments. Is also the importance of wars. And you, you are beginning to see this now in the United States, right, with, uh, with President Trump. But this, it started happening in Cyprus in 2013, right? Um, so uh, it, it wasn't, it's not just four governors, four governors have resigned, right, or have been effectively forced out of office. Now that's 19 countries, like, it's like going to a quarter of them, right? It's, it's, it's a trend. And the question also that you need to ask is what are the others doing in terms of their behavior when they see this? Are they not more inclined to conform, right, to the government's wishes if they see this, if they want to stay until the end of their term? So it's not just who resigned, it's also what this means for the behavior of others. And I can talk about the behavior of Italy when it comes to not deciding not to bail in. Uh, the, two, uh, the, the creditors, the so-called retail investors in the two banks that failed a few years ago, but I'm not covering this now. Uh, so what we've seen also, and <coughs> I don't have the numbers, but I think it's a worthwhile exercise, we have the appointment, I mean, uh, excuse the expression, uh, but there's no other way to, ex to express that, the cronies from central bank boards, right? Cronies and um, commissars, I would also, uh, and I've seen that, Co commissars, right? Um, people who just go to political party meetings and then come to the central bank and, and, and actually say that this is what we discussed in the, in the meeting with the leader of my party and this is important, this is what you have to do, right? And it's just so open and blatant. It's, and this central bank are meant to be independent. Right. On top of that, the erosion that you've seen, and that's like the last year and a half, it's all the numerous money laundering scandals. It's not just one or two. It's a lot of them, right? And there's something systemically wrong there. And all the proposals, all the proposals about improving the architecture have not yet touched that. And there's a very good reason why we've seen that. Because we created the banking union, we created the SSM, the single supervisory mechanism in Europe, and we excluded the supervision of anti-money laundering, counter-financing of terrorism from the SSM. That re has remained in the hands of national regulators, and there's a big weakness there. Uh, ECB itself has struggled because of all the non-standard measures and, and, and the QE, but also doing whatever it takes meant that it faced a lot of political objection and legal objections from within Germany in particular. Although they, it has withstood those legal tests, nevertheless they have created a climate of questioning of the ECB and I think that's partly what probably explains the decline of the euro's popularity in Germany itself, which I think is, is very worrying actually for the next five years. Right. Um, so why? We want to dig a little bit further into that. Why have we seen that independence of central banks have been eroded. Now, I can tell you about Cyprus and Slovenia, it's, it's sort of a, a no-brainer in some sense. We bailed in investors, right, in, in the banks. And we even bailed in depositors in Cyprus, right? And in Slovenia, they, they bailed in bondholders, etc. Et and it's, it's this so-called, and bailing, of course, was introduced to make uh, too big to fail, to address too big to fail, and to make sure there's fair burden sharing and all the rest of it. 
But when it comes to the political context, I see very little support for the taxpayer. I see a lot of support for those guys who lose money when a bank fails, right? And that's how the political systems are, tend to be geared. And so these guys organize themselves or, or have levers anyway on the political system, right? Um, another commonality between Cyprus and Slovenia is both central banks have both supervision and resolution responsibilities, both. And that happens actually in 10 out of 19 euro area central banks. Although at the European level, we have created a separation of supervision from resolution, which makes huge sense. That's what you need to have. Potentially a lot of conflicts there. At the national level, this hasn't happened. Greece is one of them, right? Um, Italy, I believe, is another one. And, and um, um, Netherlands is, is another one, where resolution and supervision is within the central bank. Also Cyprus, Slovenia, and um, uh, quite a few others. Now, Latvia is slightly different, and we've seen the money laundering sort of scandals, the ABL, ABLV, action by FinCEN, and all the rest of it. And we don't really know. It's not, I, I don't really personally have a, a lot of information what happened uh, if this was related to uh, uh, Ilmar and Savage sort of forcing out of office. They never sacked him, but they just forced him out of office by basically detaining him over a weekend, and then the judge released him, saying that, yes, I'm releasing you, but uh, the conditions is that you don't go to your office in the central bank. <laughs> you don't go to Frankfurt, right? So they never sacked him, but effectively, they have removed him from office it, over a weekend, right? And this is, there is a treaty there which says, you know, this independence of the governors, it's so sacrosanct. And it took like several months before the ECB decided what to do. And of course they did the right thing. They went to the European Court, right? And the European Court basically upheld um, what the ECB said, that this was just for, um, wrongful removal. It didn't really adhere to the treaty. What happened next? I don't know. Latvia is continuing. Uh, it's, it's sort of uh, attack on Rim Savage. And of course, I, I only met Ilmar Rim Savage a couple of times. I don't know if those allegations are true. And I don't know how you handle that. But what has happened for sure is that the removal from office has been very quick, very effective, and very much against the European Treaty. Right? In Germany, the legal attacks against the ECB have failed, but they were very high profile, and they they were on, on OMT and the asset purchasing program. OMT, by the way, never, was never used, but it, was, it did help to calm down the market by the time. Now, we, we've had others, and I meet occasionally young students, and he tells me what is happening in Greece, why the Syriza government and, and the, the MPs are making his life really very miserable. And, and also, he, the way that, that this has been attacked is through, sort of, through his wife. Right? They round up family members and they do criminal investigations. I mean, it, this is very inventive and unbelievable. It's putting pressure on the government, right? And it's, it's, not, it's not accidental. Italy also recently about you know, the uh, resignation of the senior deputy governor we've had because of uh, political pressures. Uh, but then Slovakia is another country where the governor is, uh, is resigning early because of political pressure. So there is partly this tendency that we want to call populism. I'm not sure it's the right term, but certainly we've seen the rise of, of parties that show little respect for educated elites, they call us. I think. Educated elites. It's, it's, it's the common thing that tends to unite across the Atlantic, I think, um, a, lot of, a lot of people. It's not, it's not to do with left-right. It's, it's more against things that we, we, we sort of call dear, right? You know, we want analysis to be evidence-based. Even if we disagree, right? We still want you know, the, the policy sort of uh, to be evidence-based and based on research. So this is what, what is happening, is rejecting the completely educated elites. Um, we also have issues with error responsibilities in Europe. I don't have much time, but I can talk about that. That's emergency liquidity assistance. Um, and what we've seen with the ECB itself 
is that Mario and, and um, Mario Draghi, but also the person who is in charge of, of legal, at the, at the ECB executive uh, board member, if merged, uh, he's published stuff, and given talks about the independence, and basically his interpretation is that it, it only covers monetary policy. Anything else, because we don't have a clear mandate, we don't have a clear objective, monetary policy you have, price stability, very easy to define. When it comes to financial stability, well, we're not sure, right? So that really has meant, actually it's a signal. When you say that, the politicians would just go for that. Those who want to undermine the, the independence of the central bank will, will try and use that. They will not go for pri anything to do with price stability, the governing council, right? Except in Germany, where they, they, they <coughs> But in the, in the peripheral countries, they would go for other things, like supervision, resolution, financial stability. Right, I talked <coughs> quite a bit about Cyprus, and I don't know how much you know about it. I'm go gonna have four slides about the Cyprus crisis. Partly because it demonstrates the importance of Minsky, I think so. Um, and why, why is it, why it's relevant? It shows um, the imperfections of the financial architecture that we have in place. Cyprus joined in 2004, the European Union, right? In 2008, it joined the Euro. Of course, it liberalized the financial system, and what we had is a lot of euphoria, right, as a result. And underestimation of risks, right? People just didn't think of risk. They thought of the opportunities, right? Um, and this is completely consistent with the financial instability hypothesis. But in, in, in practice, in what happened is that there was a service, a service industry there, lawyers, accountants, bankers, and they actively promoted, um, well, they really went after Russian business, right? Russian and Ukrainian at some point, but maybe Russian. So, and Russians who are looking to optimize their affairs, I'm trying to put this sort of diplomatically, right? <laughs> as, as diplomatically as possible, right? Uh, supervision of the banking system didn't change, because of course didn't, we didn't have the SSM until 2014, right? Um, and, and we did have the SSM partly because of the Cyprus crisis, but also other problems. Um, so it remained as it was, right? I, I'm, I'm not gonna blame my predecessor, right? But he just inherited the system, he didn't change it. He tried once to introduce some macroprudential rules on credit expansion, and the, the parliament all in its entirety went against him, so he backed up, right? Um, so risks were high, but they were ignored, basically. Um, this is sort of um, the size of the banking system. It went up to nine times GDP, and a lot of it was Russian money coming in, and Ukraine, right? Um, so they call it, some people call this financial development, but this is also <laughs> built up of risk, right? It's also built up of risk, huge built up of risk. Um, and if you look at European rankings at the time, you see that Cyprus has the top two positions, Bank of Cyprus and Laiki. And each bank, two times GDP, the balance sheet. So you can imagine how much power, political power they have, right? This is one of the first things that I faced, the political power of Bank of Cyprus. So this is the attempt for a Minsky moment, right? You can see bank credit to the private sector. And at some point it was highest in the world, right? highest in the world. Um, okay. And this is a gamble for resurrection on, on GGBs, Greek government bonds. Because NPS were rising. People say that the Cyprus crisis was caused by the Greek crisis. That's just the tip of the iceberg, right? My analysis in the book is that the banks went for GGBs because they are income dried up, because of NPLs that they were managing to hide. So if there's one takeaway to take from the Cyprus crisis is this. The GGBs were a symptom rather than the cause of the crisis. It was a trigger, of course, for the crisis. But they were a symptom of other problems. Uh, this is the timeline of the crisis, and the second bullet point is the most important one, right? I had nothing to do with any of what you saw before, right? I was in the UK at the University of Leicester, a professor, right? I did not even have a credit card from a Cypriot bank. Right? I did not even have an account. Okay, so the rest is what actually happened during the crisis. And we have 
the agreement, the final agreement, happened on 35th March 2013, and it involved the bailing of, of bondholders, shareholders, of course, and uninsured depositors, and about four billion of uninsured money belonged to Russians, right? So they were not happy. And the people who represented them were not happy. It turned out the people who represented them were the people in government. And it turned out the president's law firm, right? Mr. Uh, Anastasiadis' law firm, was representing some of the Russians who lost money in the crisis. It turned out the vice president of Banu Cyprus was a certain gentleman, um, uh, Vladimir Strashkovsky, who was very close to Mr. Putin, but also a client of the Nikos Anastasiadis law firm. It's just facts, right? Um, just turned out, right? So you can imagine why there was a need for a scapegoat, massive need for a scapegoat. And the Central Bank of Cyprus was a very convenient scapegoat, partly because we gave ELA to Likey, as if we could not give ELA to a systemic bank twice the size of GDP. What would have happened? We did not have, we could not bail it in, we did not, we did not have resolution legislation at the time, so the only thing we were working towards is to give time to the politicians to find a solution, basically. Find, and, and, but we were blamed for that. And of course, the bailing in the end protected public finances. Why Cyprus has recovered so quickly from the crisis? Precisely because of the bailing. If they had borrowed as much as was needed to bail out the banks, it would have been worse than Greece. It would have had higher debt to GDP ratio than Greece. Okay, so. I mentioned about the scope of, um, of the independence. I already mentioned about uh, uh, Mer, uh, what he said. And um, is there anything else here? Here is a single supervisory board. If you look at that, it's independent only in so far the ECB members are concerned. So the other, the non ECB members, have no independence protections, no independence safeguards. Right? And that's been part of the problem. Do they matter? Yes, they do matter, these setbacks. There's another example from Cyprus, the failure of the coal bank that was in the hands of the current government. And although it was supervised by SSM, um, it was um, basically the exercise for bearings because the Central Bank of Cyprus asked them to do that, right? And they, they were trying to protect the government. Um, they didn't want to, a failing bank just before the election. So Mr. Anastasiadis got re-elected, and a couple of months later, the bank failed. That's what exactly happened. And now is there, is, there was an inquiry that actually showed that, a judicial inquiry. And of course, the government tried to discredit it. But it's there, 800 pages. So small countries matter. Of course, I'm from a small country. I want to say that they do matter. But if you think of money, of, uh, money laundering, right? political money laundering, where would they, these guys go? They would go, they would go to the, the weakest link. And, and once dirty money enters, it would just go throughout the single market, right? So that has additional implications. And I think the erosion of central bank independence, as we've seen, is contagious. It doesn't stop. You can't say Cyprus is an isolated case, although many may have said that a few years ago. Okay, I'm not going to talk about it. In my new book, I have six recommendations how to fix the problems in Europe, but part of it is introducing fit and proper criteria for central bank boards. There's none, although we have them for commercial bank boards. There's none for central bank boards. Um, a pan-European regulator for LMRCFT and, and uh, Europeanizing emergency liquidity assistance, separating out SSM from the ECB, right? And um, removing resolution from, from national central banks. And of course, increasing the presence and visibility of the ECB in, in, in member states. Commission has representative offices in each member state, the ACB doesn't. So at that point, I will end. Thank you. Good morning, uh, everybody. I have no PowerPoint. Uh, panel at this uh, annual Minsky conference. I 
people so honored to have been uh, invited. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to be on the panel with my PhD supervisor, uh, Jan Kregel. So once again, thank you very much. Uh, the topic is the, is the outlook, uh, public of the outlook for Euro uh, system reform. And uh, like, like the previous speaker, I'd like to focus uh, most of my, uh, my time on monetary policy. And I'd like to argue that a review of the ECB monetary policy strategy, its instruments, and also the underlying philosophy or theory, if you like, is highly needed. Uh, such a review of its policy and its strategy has not taken place since uh, 2003, and that was five years after the adoption of the strategy. And uh, we are now 15, 16 years later, and I don't have to tell you that a lot has happened in the, in the meantime. So what I'd like to do is to very briefly uh, review the evolution of the, uh, the strategy, the evolution of the, uh, the instruments, uh, and uh, briefly uh, <coughs> review the ECB's uh, performance. And if there's still some time left, I'd like to mention my nine, nine favorite reforms of the, the overall framework. So let me first, first talk a bit about the ECB uh, strategy. And my main point there is that the strategy has drifted away gradually uh, from its original so-called two-pillar strategy. The strategy of the ECB was to maintain price stability. That's what it had to do from uh, the context of the treaty. And it had two, two pillars to do so, two sets of data and analysis it looked at the so-called monetary pillars pillar, which was a guideline for money growth of 4.5%, uh, and in so-called broader economic analysis, which looked at all other factors that may have an impact on price stability. And on the basis of uh, the development of these two pillars, there was an assist assessment by the ECB government council, the decision-making body of the risk of price stability, uh, and on that basis, it determines its policy, its policy so what we have seen is a, a de-emphasizing of the role of money in the, in the strategy. As I mentioned uh, uh, seconds ago, initially there was a guideline for 5% money growth, for growth money growth, to be revised annually. After the first revision of the ECB monetary uh, strategy, uh, there were no longer annual revisions. And in 2007, the guideline that we moved totally in the background uh, was forgotten. Basically, and that was at the moment that uh, the money growth was 12% on an annual basis, and year after year it had been much higher than the 4.5%. So that's the, that's the first thing, the de emphasizing the monetary pillar, the monetary analysis. Uh, secondly, the ECB, uh, when it launched its strategy, it emphasized that it was not, unlike almost all countries at, the, uh, at that time, it was not an inflation target. Use these two, these two pillars to assess risk of price stability. Uh, over the past years, and mostly during the, the drug era, the ECB has become a very narrow inflation target. It targets an inflation rate of 1.8 or 1.9 percent on an annual basis. That's what it is targeting now. It has moved from that's the third point. It has moved from a focus on headline inflation to a focus on core, uh, core inflation. In the initial strategy was uh, argued that you should focus on headline inflation in the medium, uh, in the medium term, uh, because the, at that time in many countries, so-called core inflation uh, did, not, did not predict uh, headline inflation, but followed it uh, more than that. So that's, that's very quickly uh, on, the, uh, on the strategy. So then on the, on the instruments, uh, after having hit the uh, zero lower bound, uh, many so-called unconventional monetary policy instruments were introduced. Uh, no need to go into all of them, uh, but they included a lengthening of the uh, term over which liquidity was provided, uh, uh, indirect provision for credit to the 
in the financial sector. Of course, QE, uh, the OMT program was already mentioned by the previous uh, speaker. And one element which is not often mentioned, but which uh, is, is, in my view, rather important, uh, there is nowadays what is called unlimited access to the ECB credit facilities by commercial, uh, by commercial banks, provided they, uh, they have the right uh, collateral, but the set of collateral was already very broad uh, at the start uh, of the ECB, and it has been broadened much further during the crisis. So unlimited In terms of uh, performance, uh, seven, seven, seven points there. F first of all, if you look at the actual uh, achievement of price stability, which is the, the primary objective uh, in the EU treaty for the ECB, has to maintain price stability, uh, subject, uh, subject to having achieved that, has to still support the other. Price stability is its primary objective. If you look at that objective, uh, you could argue that it, uh, it, it was maintained, price stability was achieved uh, until before the crisis, for sure. And you could argue that it, it remained the case, arguably, until around 2012. Secondly, uh, the euro so far at least survived the biggest financial crisis since the, since the Great Depression and the ECB has played a very fundamental role in making that, uh, making that possible. But, uh, so these first two things I think are, are really achievement and we should not uh, underestimate the achievement. However, uh, that's my third point, during the past five years does not achieve its own set target. The core inflation rate that it is targeting is hovering around one, one and a half uh, percent and doesn't move at all. Uh, fourthly, the, uh, the ECB, put a little bit provocatively, doesn't understand the inflation process in the euro area anymore. They don't understand it. It systematically overestimates both inflation and unemployment, which is a nasty combination, but overestimate <laughs> both inflation and unemployment at the same time. So something is wrong with the modeling, with the models at the, uh, at the ECB and this uh, systematic, uh, systematically overestimating inflation and unemployment is documented in a recent paper by Sol Darbach from the Berlin Institute in the University that shows it very clearly and, and convincingly. The target uh, has, not achieve, uh, has not been achieved in the past five years at least, uh, despite uh, 2.6 trillion uh, QE, a zero, uh, and then as far as the deposit rate programs go to negative uh, interest rates for almost five years, and a gradual uh, recovery from the crisis. So policy has been uh, ineffective and or very inefficient uh, during those, those years. Um, sixth point, the, uh, the so-called convergence criteria. These are criteria in the EU treaty that uh, countries have to meet on a sustainable basis for a sustainable monetary union uh, are no longer are no longer met either in a, during or after the crisis countries have not converged but have diverged and uh, it's the case not for let's say the smaller uh, countries but it's for, for poor countries like Italy in particular but also for uh, France that's the, that's the case if you look at Italy uh, it has not uh, it, it's government debt is above the famous 60%, is not really declining in that direction, it's more than double that. But also France has a, uh, has a uh, debt that is approaching the 100% uh, uh, and is, is, is relatively, relatively stable. If you look at Italy, its competitive position 
has been weak throughout the Euro era. Uh, its, uh, its growth has been stagnating over uh, 20 years, and that is, of course, in the first place uh, a problem uh, for Italy and uh, the Italians, but it is a problem for the Euro area as a whole. Somehow, Italy cannot flourish in this uh, in this Eurozone while other countries uh, can. So it's a big, a big problem, and it is a problem also for monetary policy. If you have such, such divergent uh, conditions, and I think to add to that and to repeat that that uh, the, the uh, European Commission, uh, supported by the countries, I should say, does not really. Guardian of these convergence uh, criteria, so so they continue <coughs> to, to persist uh, for many years now. So finally, uh, what I would call the cohesion that the ECB uh, governing council has uh, has weak uh, during and after the, the crisis. There is no longer, I should say, a shared philosophy. Should be what the president uh, should uh, should be. So that's very quickly the uh, the, uh, the performance. Uh, then, then this ineffective and or inefficient uh, policy has at the same time important risks and consequences. First of all, it undermines the ECB credibility. So year after year, cannot meet your own uh, targets. Secondly, the undermining of the ECB independence. Uh, and the previous speaker uh, rightly emphasized, let's say, the, the pressure from the outside on the, on the ECB. I think it's fair, fair to say that the ECB, by broadening its acti activities, by, by <coughs> pursuing activities, uh, of course, forced partly by the, uh, by the crisis, uh, broadened its activities, uh, which uh, can no longer be limited mandate, which is a, you know, in my view, is a prerequisite for making the central bank so independent as uh, the ECB has uh, done. So, not voluntarily, but the ECB has invited, uh, as it were, uh, <coughs> people start to discuss it, it's independent, given it the impact that, that for example, QE <coughs> has on pension funds, <coughs> life insurance companies, and the wealth distribution. Thirdly, solidification of banks and firms, uh, contributing to low productivity and economic growth, uh, moral hazards, hampering adjustment capacity of countries and their, uh, <coughs> and their economies, uh, potential, and, and, and sometimes more than potential, bubbles in asset markets and housing, uh, housing markets. In my own country, the Netherlands, we have housing prices uh, increase, <coughs> increasing by 10% on an annual basis now for three years. Uh, in, in a row. Uh, there's the, the risk of inflation, at least uh, if you take inflation in a broader, uh, broader term, actual inflation, as I said, doesn't move at all, which is a, a difficult uh, combination. There is an elimination uh, of financial market functioning because of uh, QE. There's a risk of boom bust uh, cycle. There is the, uh, the point that the ECB is I would say running out of proportionate instruments to combat a next recession or a slowdown or a deflation. So, in sum, uh, an ineffective policy uh, with uh, substantial risks and consequences. So, high time for a uh, review and to very seriously look at uh, where, where, we, uh, where we stand. Time for a review that the, the, the ECB would not be an outlier in doing that. As I said, it hasn't, hasn't done it since 2003. Here in the US, the Fed is doing the, the Florida uh, review, the Bank of Canada is doing the review, and the Swedish Central Bank has done the review uh, already. It's also a very uh, unique and right moment to do so. There will be a new ECB president. Uh, 
make sure that president uh, should be to, to start that uh, review. Uh, there are also eight NCB, the National Central Bank governors, uh, to be replaced <coughs> this year. There are other board members uh, leaving, leaving shortly. So there's a lot of change at the NCB government council. It's, 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 it's again, I think, a good moment to, uh, to do that review, uh, try to view it as objectively as, as possible. That's why I am in favor of appointing an ECB president uh, outside of the circle of government, uh, current uh, government council members and outside of certainly uh, the finance ministers of the euro area uh, countries. Uh, somebody with a, a strong academic background, but knowing the system rather, uh, rather well. I still have five minutes, so that's uh, that's that's what's my, my, my argument for a for a review, then, then let me then uh, not very modestly put my uh, my cards on the on the on the table. Uh, what I'd like to see, uh, I immediately say it's, it's very unlikely that this will uh, th that this will happen. I think in the broader context of reform outside monetary policy, uh, I think the most likely uh, outcome uh, will be yeah, kind of uh, muddling muddling through, but in the direction of slow further integration. I think that's the most likely outcome that we will uh, see, but a lot will depend also on the European elections that also will take place this year in uh, end, end, of, end, of, end of May. So what I would like to uh, <coughs> to see, let me mention nine points very, very quickly in those <coughs> four minutes, that's still in May, adopt an inflation target with a range. Uh, re rehabilitate, uh, reintroduce money and financial variables by including financial stability or preferably financial resilience considerations into the monetary policy uh, framework. Most important thing that you have to do there is to lengthen the horizon over which uh, monetary policy should achieve price stability. I would argue that we uh, should agree on a minimum policy rate of 0.5%, explicitly stating that we will not, not go negative in the euro area uh, monetary policy. QE, uh, I would see that as a crisis instrument, not as a normal instrument of monetary uh, policy, and only in situations of actual debt deflation <coughs> uh, as a threat uh, to be used and not a normal circumstance. Back to limited access to the ECB, so no longer uh, all liquidity source resources making available. Back to only interfering shorter money markets. Uh, so that's 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 my six six points for the for the ECB. Now I add three that are outside of the ECB proper, and they are all highly controversial. Again, no chance of having this. Uh, adopted uh, probably, but perhaps worth mentioning that. The first is that I'd like to see the, uh, the stability and growth pact and the uh, macro imbalances procedures and all the other rules that we have formulated in Europe for monetary policy, for macroeconomic policies, uh, to abandon them all. Uh, no longer apply them. Uh, that's good news for those who uh, could never apply uh, with them. It's also good news for those uh, who ask for apply uh, complying with them because they were never uh, forced at all. So fa phase out the European stability mechanism rather than, than beefing it up with the current, uh, current idea in a European monetary fund. I'm, I'm especially worried about the monetary part in it. Uh, initially, you can be sure will not uh, uh, be allowed to create money. But, uh, I wonder why you would call the monetary fund. It's in the longer term, that will not be something ambitious as kind of liquidity creation via the EMA. So face it out. If, uh, I, I see it as something that had to be done, like the OMT. It, it, it was crisis. The crisis is sometimes have to you do things you would like. Uh, face it out. Uh, and finally, uh, and, and the first
first, the first one, uh, the first that I mentioned on the, the budgetary rules and so on, that of course requires a, a change to the, the EU treaty, so a treaty revision uh, is, is required to do that. And it's also true for the final one. I'd like to give countries uh, the option to leave the euro area, but stay within the, uh, the stay within the EU. That's currently not possible. So either in the euro area and EU or Europe, you're out. So give the give countries the option to do that, uh, and uh, it is to make it obligatory if a debt restructuring restructuring somehow is uh, is needed. So those were my. everybody always has a certain conflict of interest. You want your students to do well, but you're a little invidious when they do better than you do. <laughs> <laughs> Lex is an example, an example of this. And he's even gone beyond my expectations with his recommendations, which are even more radical than I am going to propose for you at this point. Uh, the title which I've, I've picked today is Level Playing Fields of Flanders. You all know where Flanders is, I presume, someplace around Brussels. And we had things around there, and they had battles, and basically what we've been talking about is the battles that we have for the reform of the European system, and in particular the Euro. Now, What I'm going to give you is a very short uh, presentation of a recent experience of mine as the advisor to uh, the Italian Minister for Economic, or sorry, European Affairs, after the election of the recent of the recent uh, government. Those of you who are familiar with the uh, political background, the Italian election produced a basic divergence between a we may call, I think, generously a right-wing party and a left-wing party. And it was presumed that a government could never be founded on this basis. In fact, they confounded public opinion by, in fact, appointing a government. And one of the, uh, of the linchpins of this political compromise was to be the appointment of a minister of finance who was not a member of either party and was considered to be, uh, shall we say, a wise old man who I had worked for previously. Now this wise old man had uh, already formulated a project for leaving the Euro and created a great deal of public dismay and a great deal of European dismay. So in the end, rather than having him as finance minister, they decided to appoint as the Minister of European Affairs someone who was formerly on record as being in favor of Italy leaving the Euro. At that stage, I was appointed as an advisor, and the objective that we had was, number one, to prevent the government from falling, number two, to prevent the government from proposing leaving the Euro, and number, th number three, providing some sort of reasonable explanation of what the government policy, in fact, was going to be. Because it was not clear that the government did have any policy aside from what had been presented during the political campaigns as we're getting out. So what we eventually produced is this document uh, in which eventually it was uh, we say marketed in a uh, publicly available provision. And basically this was, and I'll tell you the end of the story right away, this was because the government decided to drop the proposal uh, completely and the minister was invited to become the head of the Stock Exchange Commission, which is his current, uh, his current position. And my current position is fortunately I'm no longer 
required to advise the government on what it should do with the euro. As you can see, the document is drafted by the ministry to propose the creation of a high-level working group composed of representatives of member states, the parliament, and the commission, which will examine the correspondence of the current European institutional architecture and economic policy with the objectives of growth and the stability of full employment explicitly foreseen in the EU treaties. Basically, what we were doing was trying to say, well, it's obvious, number one, that Italy is not leaving. Number two, it's pretty obvious that most of the changes which would be required, which we would desire, would require some sort of change in the European treaties, which is a very long and complicated process, and something which would not alleviate the difficulties that would have been faced both by the Italian economy, as Lex has already uh, highlighted, and were being faced by the government. So the idea that we came up with was to say, well, let's provide a document and let's go to the council and, or sorry, the parliament and the commission and say, look, we know that we have problems and let's <coughs> set up a working group to recognize that we're going to have to take changes and have to recommend those changes inside of the EU. So that Italy was the instigator of what became a common discussion within the EU uh, of what changes would be, would be required. So basically what the document does is to try and justify the necessity for the working group. And basically it's divided into, uh, divided into two sections. And the first part, and this is the, the title of the idea of the level playing field. If we look at the, well, all of those conditions which Lex wants to get rid of, and I you know, actively support that, the reason that they're there, and quite sensibly they're there, is because if you were going to use a, or introduce a single currency, which was very quickly recognized as an integral component of the Single European Act, and you're going to use this to operate monetary policy, it requires that you have at least a modicum of uniformity across national economies. And basically, this is what these conditions are meant to do. The, con the convergence, convergence criteria are to say, is if I'm going to set monetary policy at 2% or 3% or 4% or whatever, it means that in general, the inflation rates in the economies have to be reasonably similar. It means that the fiscal stances of the governments have to be reasonably similar and the debt positions of the government should be reasonably similar. So it made, it made a great deal of sense. Everybody attacked these as being out of, uh, uh, out of the logic, the economic logic, but they made very simple sense on this idea of the level playing field. If you're going to have a single monetary policy, you're going to have a single currency, then everybody should be more or less similar if the policy is going to work. Now, the difficulty was that these things were, in general, not respected. And the idea was that these conditions, which we set out in the protocol, everybody knows the famous numbers, uh, were interpreted as convergence. So if it looked like you were moving in the right direction, you were given the benefit of a doubt that, in fact, probably you would be more or less similar to what the other economies in the system looked like. Now, in Italy's case in particular, although Italy was moving in the right direction on a number of, uh, a number of indicators, the indicators were widely outside of what was considered as being acceptable. <coughs> and as we now know, there was, shall we say, help from Goldman Sachs and a number of other investment banks in order to arrange the Italian accounts in such a way that they appeared at least to be converging towards the, uh, towards the, European, towards the European limits. So we start out by saying one of the basic, uh, basic ideas was this level playing field. It was a good idea. It was never, in fact, honored. And in general, there were a number of, shall we say, divergences which were created by, as I've already mentioned, Italy being outside the, the norms, and Germany after reunification, which allowed them to move substantially uh, away from the European Union. Now, if we look at this, in this aspect, we say the single currency was novel in, uh, in two respects. First, it was a fixed exchange rate system introduced, as I say, in the presence of an international sea of floating exchange rates. 
Okay? If you remember this particular period, this is the period in which the revenue system, the fixed exchange rate, was breaking down. Everybody was moving away from fixed rates, and the EU decides to go in the opposite direction. This is a problem, I think, that analysts failed to appreciate in terms of the difficulties that this would create internally. Now, we also know that this eliminated the national exchange rate adjustments as the remedy to correct trade imbalances among members, and it meant that basically you went to a policy of what we call internal, uh, internal adjustment. This means relative domestic wage and price adjustments within the Eurozone and the non-Eurozone trading partners. And this is a point I'm going to try and stress, is that if you're looking at this idea of internal adjustment, internal adjustment may, may, may make sense within an area, but it may not make a great deal of sense when you're looking at adjustment relative to out-of-area trading, uh, trading patterns. So that basically the idea is that these adjustments had a differential impact on relative competitiveness within and without the Eurozone, making their impact very difficult to determine. So that basically what happened is, given this lack of full convergence, the internal adjustment became an austerity policy, reducing Eurozone growth performance. And Italy was the out, outlier case in this, particular, uh, in this particular sense, because it was farther outside the conditions of the level playing field. The second uh, area in which it is different is that the central, the central bank design was something which had never been seen before. Basically, it was uh, what in the old German case we called a Notenbank. It was a bank of history that issued the currency, but it was independent of any national government or any national government balance sheet with the basic objective of price stability, which meant that you no longer had any possibility of direct coordination between national fiscal policies or EU-wide fiscal policies and monetary policies. These things were basically, uh, basically separate. So we call this, I would call this an institutional omission in the European architecture, which is basically what we've been talking about. How to fix that. Uh, when Godley, a former uh, distinguished scholar here at the Institute very quickly had pointed out the difficulties that this raised when he talked about the treaty, the EU Maastricht Treaty proposing a no new institutions other than the European Bank. And he says this could really be correct if modern economies were self-adjusting systems that didn't need any management at all. But clearly this was not the case. So he pointed out that the Maastricht criteria for the establishment of convergence were far too narrowly conceived. And <coughs> not narrowly conceived in terms of their values, but basically it looked like they were too narrowly, succeed, narrowly conceived because they did not fulfill the conditions necessary for successful currency union. It was not nearly enough that member countries agree to follow simple rules on budgetary policy. They need to reach a degree of structural homogeneity such that shocks to the system as a whole do not normally affect component regions in drastically different ways. Noting that if Europe is not to have a full-scale budget of its own, you will still have by default a fiscal stance of its own made up of the individual budgets of component states. The danger then is that the budgetary strength to which governments are individually committed will impart a disinflationary bias that blocks Europe as a whole into a depression that it is powerless to lift. So basically the problem that we were pushing, the problem that we were emphasizing, is that what you had done in the creation of this Euro, particular European architecture is that you left the decisions over fiscal policy to national governments. They were then to be constrained by the protocol, but there was no possibility of coordinating these national positions in terms of the various differences in economic <coughs> performance for the particular nation states. So it's a problem of looking at the overall policy relative to the individual policies. And this is a difficulty that would be faced even if you were to have a European financial uh, regulator or a European Ministry of Finance doing these, uh, uh, the decisions on overall fiscal policy, because you would still have differences in domestic fiscal policy. 
Now, the last point that I want to make, and this is the one I raised previously, is that when you went to the fixed exchange rate system, because the idea was that this would eliminate the problems that had been caused by differential productivity and growth between uh, France and Germany, and that had caused exchange rate crises, the idea was that having a fixed exchange rate would eliminate these problems. Well, in fact, it didn't. It didn't for a number of reasons. First of all, as we know, because of the differential between countries, but also because of the differential between rates of exchange of domestic economies and their non-EU partners. So it's quite possible that changes in the, well, sorry, the elimination of these bilateral exchange rates could be superseded by changes in rates of exchange of domestic economies vis-a-vis -vis non eurozone members. And we can see this quite clearly. When the euro fluctuates, obviously it changes the real exchange rate of Germany, or the what used to be the real exchange rate of Germany relative, say for example, China, while it also changes it in a very different way of Italy relative to the rest of the world because of the diverse composition of their domestic economies and because of the di very diverse export uh, pattern. So that you have this possibility that exchange rate differentials, or sorry, change rate uh, revaluations and devaluations of the euro will have differential impacts on the individual economies. So that if you raise the question, you say, would it not be possible for countries to offset these differences? Well, how would they offset these differences? Obviously, in terms of national economic policy. So if you have a very sharp appreciation of the euro, which causes, you know, let's take the Italian, well, we don't want to take the uh, olive oil industry because we have difficulties in that anyway because of uh, uh, problems of the invasion of this very strange sort of disease which has attacked the olive trees. But you take it in this range, this may have a very large impact on that particular sector. And the question is, does the Italian government have the possibility to act in terms of its own domestic policy in order to offset this? And basically, currently within the uh, way fiscal policies are set up, it does not. So this is the kind of argument that we, we were putting to the Commission, uh, sorry, and to the Parliament, to say that, well, these are not only Italian problems, these are problems that are faced by every economy that has a diverse structure in terms of its domestic uh, composition of output and in terms of its domestic export pattern. So that some leeway probably should be allowed in terms of national fiscal policies in order to domestically offset this. Now, in the Italian case, this is particularly important because, as I mentioned, the government is currently comprised of these two political parties, one that represents the North, which is primarily manufacturing, and the South, which is primarily, well, it's primarily agricultural, it's primarily unemployed. The basic policies of the Labour government in the North is to reduce taxes, and the basic policy of the Cinque Stelle party in the South is to give everybody a basic guaranteed income. And obviously, these two policies do not commute, compute or anything else. So the difficulty is, can Italy provide, or can the Commission or the Parliament reach some sort of agreement which would allow a national government to introduce national policies to meet these domestic conditions? Because if this does not happen, I can predict very quickly that the Lega policy, which as I mentioned is the far right party, will probably number one, win the European elections, that uh, European parliamentary elections that are coming up, and will probably win the uh, national elections, which would then be called very soon afterwards. And this party is, um, how should we put this, uh, is at the center of the European realignment of right-wing parties, which now is going to provide, I would suggest, a very strong challenge, both to the Commission and to the existence of the euro, so that the creation of additional fiscal policy space is politically, politi politically important. Uh, yeah, I will also mention that Keynes has already seen this problem. We don't have Keynes, so we saw every problem. <laughs> Just to end up, um, I'm going to put up a diagram which is due to Rob Parenteau. Rob is here. 
complex in the audience, which he's developed. Rob rescued the 45 degree line diagram from its ignoble use by, uh, by uh, Hicks and Hansen to produce a very nice diagram looking at the various combinations of fiscal surplus, current account surplus, or sorry, fiscal position, external position, and private sector position, according to the famous fiscal balances of Parsons and Godley. Now, what I've done in this diagram is simply to plot the various countries in terms of their positions. And to give you an idea of the argument, if you look, Italy is here in a position in which it has a relatively large private sector surplus. It does have a current account surplus. One of the reasons that it has a current account surplus is the growth rate is so low. Uh, but if we look at the kinds of adjustments we would like, the idea is that this 3% line and there is the fiscal, uh, the fiscal balance line. So you would like to have countries in the fiscal balance line. If you look at the fiscal surplus line and the current account surplus line, you see you have Germany and the Netherlands are there. And basically the argument I'm making is that if you look at the impact of the exchange rate, the euro exchange rate moves. And moving the exchange exchange rate will change that EZ number, the EZ, this is Eurozone, okay? And that will move that Eurozone number someplace in between current account surplus and current account deficit. The problem is that it also is going to change the position of all the individual countries, okay? So that you have sort of an n-dimensional matrix here. And what we tend to be missing is by focusing on the Eurozone position, and the Eurozone has a net fiscal surplus, the problem is that if you alleviate that surplus, you say what we were going to do is to provide some sort of fiscal support that would push the Eurozone back towards the, uh, the center of the diagram. In fact, all of these other countries are going to move and you have no idea which way they're going to move. And if First of all, you don't know which way they're going to move. You have a political problem. And secondly, if you want stability within the system, you have to have some sort of national autonomy in terms of fiscal policy to offset the impact of those, uh, those exchange rate movements. So I'll stop there. And as I mentioned, the government became so uninterested in this particular proposal because it became very uh, concentrated on passing legislation both in order to bring in a, a, uh, a single tax and a basic guaranteed income that this went to Brussels and more or less died in Brussels. <coughs> so this is uh, okay, my experience as trying to keep Italy in the, in the Eurozone without getting the government to fall. Thank you. Well, amazingly efficient. We've got a lot of time. Uh, why don't we do three questions at a time? Take the first three. <coughs> yeah, go ahead. to be very catastrophic if the political challenges to the EU end up with political parties not willing to support it in the core state is this recipe for a financial crisis because the euro is already an important currency globally in the global financial system and, and so it's, it's not a trivial matter You mentioned you, you talked about this uh, crisis 
these negotiations uh, are being conducted under the Good Terrace framework, and that uh, and that you know takes into account that if there is going to be any solution, uh, that the Federal Republic will be uh, will be part of the eurozone. Um, do you think that's a good idea? And because you know an, an infant country trying to you know uh, consolidate the political situation, uh, being part of the eurozone would would that be a good idea? Commerce Bank is going to disappear, even with the Deutsche Bank or IMG or I'm not sure, but, which will leave Germany with basically one bank. Uh, could you discuss the financial structure in, in, um, the, the, in Europe and the implications that has for um, the economy? several very interesting and diverse questions, may I say. Um, could a political crisis cause a financial crisis? It's, uh, I think it's a very, a very good uh, sort of PhD sort of uh, thesis there. Um, I think it could. And one of, one of the problems um, that we've faced, and um, we've seen it through the crisis, is the perceptions of, of the euro remaining intact or not that immediately impacts on, on uh, um, deposits, right? Think about depositors in Greece at the peak of the Greek crisis, what were they doing? They thought uh, cash in hand is a lot safer than money in the Greek hand. <coughs> think of what might happen in Italy if Italians start thinking like that. Think of the pressures on the governing council if they're faced with supplying emergency liquid, well, non-objection basically, this is a process right, that, that, that um, works for ELA, the governing council has to give its non-objection, right? it shouldn't be seen as interfering with the monetary policy objectives or, or, the, the, or violating the monetary financing prohibition. What would happen though, I think, if there is a massive bank run in Italy, I think, I think that, that would be the biggest test ever of the governing council, the ECB, uh, providing liquidity assistance. Because I think that there is there's the question of how you interpret, completely technocratically, the political statement that some politicians are making, saying we're going to leave the euro. What does that mean for risks, right, of the individual national central banks? If you start looking at the target imbalances, right, it means that uh, if Jens Weidmann says, I'm not objective, it means that he's got 40% of that risk, of all that ELA that goes to Italian banks, he's, it's on his books, right? If they default, he's called into the German parliament to account for why he didn't, he agreed to this, right? So it's that real, right? And, and even the Cyprus Central Bank governor, you know, Cyprus could lose a few hundred million euros if Italy were to leave, right? the euro. So what happens? So it's a very serious one. And that actually um, sort of um, relates to the point I made, Europeani Europeanization of ELA. At the minute, we have something, a system in which there's no clear accountability. Who is sort of accountable for the ELA, right? And Europeanizing it, at least, would mean that we, are, we, we relieve the pressure from the national central bank. But whether it will happen or not, I'm very, uh, very doubtful. Crisis in Cyprus. Right. <laughs> uh, Limassol. I'm from Limassol, by the way. People in Limassol know very well what is happening. Right? They can see it. And they can see that, for example, the Golden Passport Saves, which has been a big winner for certain people in Cyprus, and the same law firm that helped 
to get the mo Russian money in the first place, they can see it very clearly. It's got an impact on rents, it's got an impact on living standards, and they can finally see that this is not a sustainable business, right? But for a long time, and, and in fact, I'd like to take some credit for that, because this discussion started after the publication of my book and lots of interviews that I gave, right? Because at, at least it became a matter for discussion. Do, do you understand the risks for that? And political risks, not just economic risks. But there are big economic risks. There are new bubbles being forming in real estate with the big towers and Dimassol for the associated with the passports and all the rest of it. Now, on the politics of the Cyprus, the Cyprus solution, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss. But I, what I can see is that, again, there is politics not to do with Cyprus, but politics to do with Russia and the United States. And the extent of the, the Cyprus government is torn between East and West. And there's no, I have no doubt that I think the Russian government doesn't want a solution in Cyprus. Right? That's my, my understanding of it. They don't, because they like, they have a big grip on the southern part. The minute that we'll have a Turkish Cypriot president, I'm not sure that will work very well. Right? So they, they know that the part that is the Greek Cypriot part, you know, essentially they call the shots. That's what it is. Um, now, Commerce Bank disappearing, the structure of the banking, um, of course, in, in Europe is important. I don't think that it would be, it would be disastrous, but it's, it's, it's worrying from the point of view of, uh, of political power also, having an, an enormous, gigantic bank. It was already very big, right, uh, uh, the Deutsche Bank. So with merging with Commerce Bank, and I, I'm not entirely sure they're going to solve the problems. You've got two problem banks, you put them together, you create an even bigger problem. So I'm not sure you solve anything by that. But, you know, we'll, we'll t time, time will show. I, I, I don't have any more to say. Yeah, let me, me, me continue where you, uh, where you ended and uh, offer a slightly uh, different uh, perspective on the European banking system. Uh, I think it's uh, much too fragmented. It's, uh, it's, too, it's too weak. So what is needed is uh, further concentration, uh, basically restructuring in some uh, in some areas. Whether the combination of uh, Commerzbank and Deutsche Bank is a good idea, I doubt it for the reasons uh, given. Uh, although we have to we have to say that uh, the market value of Deutsche Bank has, uh, fr uh, frankly, enormous. It's no longer very big, <laughs> a big bank uh, anymore. So I I, I, I would. I, I would certainly uh, encourage finding a, a solution again, but if this is the right solution, I uh, doubt. Uh, but it may also be my Dutch national bi bias in the direction of ING. Uh, on the, on the uh, I'd like to address one, one other issue and combine a little bit uh, a couple of the other points. The likelihood of uh, my proposals is uh, very low. I already uh, said at this what I think will happen at this stage is, uh, as I said earlier, mo moving into the, uh, the direction of uh, further integration by step by step, uh, very slowly uh, introducing further risk, risk sharing, common uh, eurozone budget, uh, beefing up the uh, European stability mechanism to the European uh, monetary fund. So moving step by step. Uh, in the direction of further uh, uh, budgetary and perhaps longer political progression. Now, on, 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 on paper, that solves the issue. Uh, th there, there's, there's, there's two problems only. Uh, it, it may lead, uh, or maybe perceived to lead, or it's likely to, uh, to lead to an other type of monetary union that the German voters wanted, the Dutch voters wanted, and a couple of other voters wanted when the euro was uh, was established, more a uh, solidarity union, more a transfer union, um, which in the end uh, people would argue, and I, I, uh, I I'm a northern European myself, so let me argue it, uh, would lead to a weaker monetary union with structurally lower growth, with structurally uh, more financial fragility, with uh, on purpose more uh, higher inflation. Going forward, not a European uh, Union, uh, European monetary union that we that we wanted. So that may then 
lead to opposition to that uh, going forward. And as Jan pointed out, there is already, uh, it's, it's I think still a minority, but it's, it's a sizable and growing and very vocal minority of people in the North arguing that, uh, that this, this is not the direction of travel that we uh, wanted. And let's say the, the, at a certain point, the, the, the preference for leaving uh, New York can come from the North rather than, than the South. So if you uh, love the Euro, and I do, uh, I was in Frankfurt when it was, uh, you must be very concerned about his flight forward uh, that in my view European institutions are taking, ignoring the underlying problems that need to be tackled first. Because I, I, I do think that in such a European uh, monetary union, that we call it provocatively the transfer union, uh, that it will also in the long term, it will not solve its own issue. It will, it will freeze them. I think we need somewhat more flexibility in the policies. And the usual approach the past few years is, is, is to say to the power, okay, you get, you get more flexibility in the policies, but then you have to do such and such and so. And the such and such and so is never done. And in the meantime, we have discovered that, you know, that the rules are not complied with. We can uh, agree on ever more rules, it will not be complied with. They have no potential. advisor to the Italian government in all this. Because Italy is now the biggest risk going forward, no doubt about it. But I, I was puzzled by their, their proposals. I thought that they could reform, I mean, if you want to help the Italian South, right, if you want to help them, the way to do it, which is politically more palatable, and it doesn't seem like a transfer, which is what North of Europe is, right? Anything that looks like transfer, you're going to get the objections from the North. <coughs> Why don't you suggest um, a reform of, of the common agricultural, right? This, you know, agricultural south of Italy. Design a reform that would not look like a transfer union, but would certainly help agriculture, right? That 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 that, that is uh, still the way the way forward. But in any case, the common agricultural policy has been seen as little bit of a transfer union anyway, but it helped the French farmers too. So. The problem, the problem is you'd have to start up policies with Cinque Stelle. Uh, they are a transfer party. Yeah. That, that, that is how they So it, for them, it's not, let me put it this way. The Italian geography is very strange. The majority of agricultural production comes from the Po Valley, in fact, in the north. The south is extremely mountainous. And aside from producing olives and, should I say, uh, collateral damage from mafia and Andragada fight between themselves, that's about all you have in terms of agriculture. Basically, uh, the agricultural policy would end up helping more. more than okay. Just as a general comment to, to Anne's thing, um, question. The problem will become first political, right? It's going to become hum political in, in, uh, in Italy. When we first started out with this process, with after the uh, new government was sworn in, we had sort of a three-pronged strategy. The first strategy was to say, as I've already mentioned, treaty, ch treaty changes will not happen. The short-term possibility is to use monetary policy we know that the ECB has been willing to use monetary policy. And after the new government was put in, the spreads went up, the spreads between uh, Italian government bonds and German government bonds went up to around 280, 285, 300 basis points. And at that stage, the difficulty was what we used to call basically the old blue move problem. 
that the increase in interest costs for the Italian government would have driven the fiscal deficit up above any conceivable limit, which would have put the government in difficulty. So everybody watches that spread, because the spread is the indicator of political difficulty. So the first thing that happened is the minister went to visit the president of the ECB and said, would the ECB be willing to intervene in the Italian government bond market in order to keep the spread within reasonable limits? Now you can imagine what the answer to that was, despite the fact that he's an Italian. Uh, so that was first strategy. Second strategy was what? Well, the second strategy was let's try this business of setting up some proposal through what is a existing channel of uh, setting up these working groups and see if that will get the spread down. And it did. And it effectively worked. <coughs> the difficulty was that it didn't solve any of the problems that we had. And very quickly, there was no response which came from Brussels. So <coughs> the third problem in the strategy was, anybody want to guess? China. And this is, in fact, where, where we have ended up. So this is, again, you look at this on a political basis, the political irritation that you get from Italy fighting about whether it gets 2.4 or 2.5 or 2. Point whatever in terms of its current budget is now a question, does it make sense for Italy to rely on an external foreign direct investor in order to solve its internal problems rather than solving them inside the inside the EU. And it is again a very strong, what should we say, impetus to the people in Brussels that perhaps it is time to think about some sort of reform of internal architecture.